Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Karen, for reading for us. Shall I pray as we begin? Uh, gracious Father, we pray this morning that you would grant us understanding um, and that by understanding uh, we would marvel more at your wonder and uh, trust you more. Uh, and we pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we're going to focus this morning on just the first two of those stories that Karen read for us. And I wonder, as she read them to us, uh, whether you were puzzled at all, or whether uh, the events recorded felt a bit strange to you. I mean, there's certainly uh, events, certainly the, the first story is something that's puzzled me uh, over the years. It just seems very strange. What's exactly going on? Um, what, why does Matthew tell us this miracle at this point in the story? Why did the disciples struggle? What does Jesus mean by the disciples having so little faith? After all, Jesus has done loads of miracles uh, up to this point, so why another one? And why this one? And why now? And the fact that I had all those questions and I was perplexed and confused just meant, of course, that I hadn't understood it. Um, so uh, it's been good to return to uh, the passage this week, have another look at it and wrestle with it again. I think I've got a bit further in my understanding. Um, you'll have to decide whether you think that's true or not. I think my problem before was that I didn't really read it carefully enough or closely enough. I hope to convince you this morning actually that the difficulties that we might have uh, that I've just outlined actually aren't really difficulties at all, or as difficult as they might first appear. And that what this episode adds at this point in Matthew's narrative is clarification what it means to have faith, something which I think is often poorly understood. So it's good for us to come to it this morning. If you've been with us over the last few weeks, you'll remember that we've had, we've been witness to, we've listened in on several significant conversations. The first we overheard uh, Peter's conversation with Christ and the disciples um, at Caesarea Philippi when they came to understand that Jesus is the Christ. Then we overheard a conversation that although they'd come to realise that Jesus is the Christ, they'd really no idea what that meant uh, for Jesus or for themselves. And then last week we uh, had a significant uh, eyewitness account of the Transfiguration and a conversation a unique event when, for a moment, reality broke into this world and the disciples caught some, a glimpse of something of Christ's glory. And remember the words that we heard from God? Listen to him. Well, we wondered what the disciples were making of all this. Um, did they understand what was going on? And then we realised that actually we didn't have to wonder, we just had to read the text, because Matthew tells us they have been in, in turns confused, astonished and terrified. And although they clearly don't understand everything that's going on, uh, they knew that something quite extraordinary, that they'd witnessed something quite extraordinary on that mountain. Well, the story continues. Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James and John, descend from their mountaintop experience uh, and meet the disciples who, in their absence, have gathered a crowd around them. The conversation that follows, Jesus says what is at first glance some quite extraordinary things. Uh, so, for example, verse 17, he says, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Strange. Or, or verse 20, replying to the disciples' questions as to why they couldn't do what he'd just done, he says, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to here, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you, for you. I mean, don't you agree they're a little bit perplexing, a little bit strange? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? If, like me, at first glance, you're a bit perplexed, why do you think that is? What is it about these conversations that perplex us? 
I want to suggest that we're perplexed for the same reasons, actually, that the disciples are perplexed at this point. They're, they're confused, as we so often are, about the whole issue of faith. We're muddled about it so often. So, uh, for example, sometimes when we think about faith, we think it can be measured and quantified. That different people have different amounts of it, and that that makes a difference. And because we think like that, we misunderstand what Jesus says here, I think. And to be fair, uh, this is something that we're not helped with in the translation, then, and we'll come to that in a bit. But the main issue, the main problem is that we have wonky ideas, like the disciples did, about what it means to have faith. What does it mean? What is faith according to the Bible? Folk have some odd ideas, don't they? Have you ever heard it said, faith is believing in something you know to be untrue? Words originally spoken by uh, Tom Sawyer, I think it was, in Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. And we hear it and we laugh at the words coming out uh, of the, the mouth of a child, and yet, it's something that many adults believe too. Others believe that faith is some sort of uh, personal disposition, some sort of natural gift or talent. You, you have it. Uh, either you have it or, or, or you don't. I, so people say, I wish I could have your faith. It's on a par with, I wish I could be as tall as you, or I wish I could run as fast as you, or I wish I could have your patience. Still others believe that faith is some sort of mystical power or quality, such that if you have lots of it, or you have a lot of people with lots of it, you have the sort of power that can do extraordinary things. So the prayer of extraordinary faith makes it possible to do things that otherwise are impossible, if you don't have much of it. I mean, the corollary of that is, of course, if you pray for something, and what you pray doesn't happen, it must be because you don't have enough of this thing called faith. Now, some of you will know that some years ago I was involved in a uh, uh, purportedly, uh, supposedly independent review of the miraculous healing claims of Mor Morris Cirillo. He was an itinerant evangelist at the time who filled Earl's Court uh, for a week, one year, uh, and claimed many miraculous healings. And a whole bunch of healthcare professionals were brought together to examine his claims of healing, or the claims of healing. One of the most distressing parts about the whole experience uh, was the testimony of a couple with a young son who was born deaf. He was born unable to hear. He had congenital deafness. They took him to the rally, I think he was about five or six at the time, where they were told that he'd been healed of his deafness. Now, it was abundantly clear to anyone who examined him that he remained deaf as a doorpost. His parents insisted, however, that he had been healed and treated them as though he could hear them. Why? Because they believed that they needed to do that. They needed to believe it to be true for it to be true. To admit that he hadn't been healed would be a lack of faith and condemn him to permanent deafness. So his deafness was a consequence, his continued deafness was a consequence of their lack of faith, so they were told. No doubt, in part, influenced the thinking by this event in Matthew. Faith is some sort of mystical power that if you have enough of, you can achieve remarkable things. Many people think that's what faith is. But we have to ask, is that right? Is that what biblical faith is? Is that what Jesus is saying here? If you read the account carefully, but not carefully enough, you might think so. What is faith according to the Bible? If you have faith, do you have a lot or a little? And if you do, what difference does that make? Does it matter? These are some of the questions I think this passage speaks to. So, let's get stuck in. James and John descend with Jesus the mountain 
and rejoin a suffering world. I mean, the anguish of this man who approaches Jesus, well, it's, it's real, isn't it, and vivid and painful. To have a child who suffers brings heartache. To one who has suffered so much and for which there would seem no hope, almost unbearable. Such was this man's experience as he approached Jesus and said to him, with evident humility and respectfully, Sir, he says, that's what Lord means here, Sir, have mercy on my son. He doesn't order Jesus, he certainly doesn't command, he asks on his knees. And as he does so, we see there's a backstory to all this. Verse 16. He's already brought his child to the disciples uh, and asked them to heal his son. But they'd been unable to. Not because they were unwilling. They were. But because they were unable to. They just couldn't do it. They'd given it a shot and failed. Now you might say at this point, well, <laughs> I'm not surprised. And at first glance, it isn't surprising, perhaps, that they couldn't do it, but perhaps it should be. If you remember back in chapter 10 of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus had given his disciples exactly that authority. Chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And if you remember, they'd gone out and done just that. So they have a track record of doing that sort of thing. But when this man approached them, they failed. Now, eyes up. Don't look at the Bible for a moment. Uh, don't normally say that. But just, just look up from your Bible and imagine you don't know what comes next. Imagine for a moment you don't know the rest of the story. What do you think Jesus might say at this point? Don't worry. Just need a bit more practice. Does he apologise for his disciples' incompetence? Or does he say, well, you need to understand, sometimes these things are difficult. No, he doesn't say any of those things, does he? Look at down and see what he does say in verse 17. And I think it comes as a bit of a surprise. Even a bit shocking. His reply is, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? You unbelieving and perverse generation. Well, they're strong words. I mean, perverse, uh, uh, they're, they're words that, that were spoken of uh, ancient Israel in the wilderness uh, back in the Old Testament. They were an evil and perverse generation. And this current lot, according to Jesus, is no better. That's Jesus' judgment on them. Should they listen to his judgment on them? 17 verse 5. This is my son. Listen to him. I think perhaps they should. Now perverse is an unusual word, isn't it? It's not one we use much today. It means illogical, irrational, unreasonable. You unbelieving and perverse generation. So for Jesus, contrary to Mark Twain, faith is not irrational. Faith is logical, it's reasonable, it's rational. It's unbelief, lack of faith, that is unreasonable, that is perverse. You unbelieving and perverse generation. Question, who are these words addressed to, these words of Jesus? <clears throat> who is this perverse and unbelieving generation? Not primarily, I think, the man at his feet, nor even the disciples, but everyone, including them, in the world around them, who looked on and who, despite all he'd said, despite all that had been done, refuse to believe. I mean, can you hear Jesus' frustration here? As those who've witnessed so much, but refused to believe, he says, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. In verse 18, Jesus rebukes the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. 
The response to Jesus' command is immediate. The boy is healed instantaneously and it is a complete healing. We see the power of the Son of God. We see Christ and his reign breaking in. So that's good, isn't it? Of course it is. But our problem and perplexity remains, doesn't it? Our difficulty with faith remains. I mean, why is Jesus so upset? People have acted appropriately, haven't they? I mean, the Father, he's acted appropriately, hasn't he? His is a humble request. He's not demanding. He's in great need and approaches Jesus, who he thinks can reach that need, and on humility, with humility on his needs, he asks him. I mean, he has faith, doesn't he? Well, not according to Jesus. No. Well, if he didn't have faith, what then is faith? Well, the disciples, I mean, they've acted appropriately, haven't they? They're seeking to do what Jesus had told them to do. They are listening to him. And with the authority that he gave them back in chapter 10, they're doing what they were told to do. Don't they have faith? Well, not here, according to Jesus, no. No. Well, if they didn't have faith, what then is faith? And of course, behind all this uh, account lies the whole issue of suffering, the backdrop to it. And many people think that suffering in general, and personal suffering in particular, is an obstacle to faith. You must have heard it said, you know, how can you have faith in a, a God who's uh, all-powerful and all-loving when there's so much suffering in the world? To believe in God, to have faith, to believe in someone who's good and powerful... Well, they wouldn't tolerate suffering, would they? They'd do something about it. But since clearly suffering is real, your God cannot be as good or as powerful as you say that he is. But when it comes to faith, the question is, when it comes to get God, the question is, is that what faith is? Believing in someone who is good and powerful and would not tolerate suffering. Or to switch the question round the other way, in a world where suffering is all too real, what does it mean to have faith? We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, are you still perplexed? Are we still perplexed? Well, stick with it, stick with it. Because uh, the disciples are clearly still confused, aren't they? Verse 19, the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? I mean, Jesus didn't seem to have any difficulty sorting it, so why did they? Now, as we've seen, that's not a stupid question for them to ask. It would be if I asked it, or if you did, uh, because Jesus has not given you or me the, such authority. But he had given it to the disciples. So it's not an unreasonable question for them to ask. And they ask it. Why couldn't they do what Jesus had just done? Now again, look up from your Bibles for a moment and ask yourself, imagining you don't know the rest of the story, what you might you expect Jesus to say at this point? Well, you haven't got the knack, let me show you, or this one's especially difficult, watch and learn, or you just need to try harder. Well, as you know, he doesn't say any of those things, does he? What does he say? Look down, verse 20. Why can't they do it? Because you have so little faith. Because of your little faith. Now it's at this point that we're not terribly helped by the translation. The original little faith in the original is one word. It's little faith. So the reference is not to an amount of something called faith. A little bit of faith. It's to something entirely different. Something called little faith. Something that stands in opposition to real faith, mini faith, shadow faith, imitation faith, in effect unbelief. He's not saying at this point what they need is just more of something called faith. It's not an issue of quantity at all, but of reality. 
I was trying to uh, think of how to illustrate this, and, and I came up with this. Sit, see if you think it works. That mini faith is a bit like mini golf. I doubt Tiger Woods would consider the game of golf just mini golf or at large. Mini golf, crazy golf. I'm sure they would argue that crazy golf is not just a smaller version of golf, but a completely different game. And in the same way here, mini faith could not properly be called faith at all. I mean, it might look like it to some, and they might even think they have it. But they don't. What they have is mini faith, mini golf. And that's something completely different. What they need is not mini faith, but faith. Still puzzled? I'm not surprised. But that's good, because it means you're listening. Let's read on, see if it becomes clearer. Verse 20. Truly I tell you, or as the older translations put it, verily, verily. So he's basically saying, heads up, listen here, this is important, big font, bold letters, underlined, truly, truly, I tell you. It is not the size or quantity of faith that matters. It can be as small as a mustard seed. And as they know, and as we may know, that's very, very small indeed. It can be as small as that and still be the genuine article. What matters, what is important, the key to understanding faith that is valid and authentic and real, that's entirely dependent on the object of that faith. You see, faith is just trust. Everyone has trust. Everyone trusts someone or something to a greater or lesser extent. And sometimes that trust is vindicated. The object of that faith is trustworthy. And sometimes it's shattered. The object of that faith is untrustworthy. But whether it's trustworthy and vindicated or untrustworthy and shattered depends not on the fervency of that faith, but on the object of that faith. Let me try and illustrate it for you. It's an illustration that I heard, but I thought was very good. See if you think it, it works. Imagine that I come to you one day and say that I've come up with a sure, fast, guaranteed investment, a sure way of doubling your money. Give me your money, and in 30 days, I promise to return it to you, double what you've given me. And you say to me, I trust you, Martin. I've got a lot of faith in you. Do you think the success of your investment depends on the amount of faith you have in me? If I were trustworthy, uh, unlikely in, in this case, in this scenario, but if I were, you'd only need a tiny bit of faith, just enough to make an investment, and you would succeed. But if I were untrustworthy, you could have all the faith in the world, and it wouldn't make a jolly difference, you'd lose all your money. The success of your investment depends not on the amount of faith you have in me, but whether or not I am trustworthy. And so do you get the point here? It's not having a lot of faith versus having a little faith. It's faith in the trustworthy versus faith in the untrustworthy. So if you have faith in God, the relevant question is not whether your faith is big or little. The relevant thing is, is your God trustworthy? That's what matters. He does not become more trustworthy by our having more faith in him. He does not become less trustworthy because of our faith is minuscule. The size of a mustard seed, even as small as that, with faith in God, trust in God, even with faith as small as that, then nothing is impossible because nothing is impossible with God. He can move mountains, metaphorically, and literally, he made them after all. Whether he does move them, or not, or whether he does anything else for that matter, doesn't depend on our faith, how much or how little we have, but on his promises 
and his purposes. Faith in God is not believing he'll do anything I want him to do. It's believing he'll do what he's promised to do. Now, perhaps that seems obvious, yet I think sometimes it needs to be said, because it's a foolish and frustrating mistake to make, but yet people make it all the time. Faith in God is believing God can do anything he wants to, not what we might want to. And it depends on him, not on me. So when we get that right, the question we need to ask ourselves is not how much faith do we have, how little faith do we have. To think like that is to have mini-faith, fake faith, pretend faith, make-believe faith. Mustard seeds faith, I reckon that's pretty universal to be honest, and I think that's alright. That's okay. Because it's the God in whom you trust that matters. If your faith is in the God who's revealed himself, as he's revealed himself, if your faith is in that God, that's what makes a difference. If it's faith in the God as you'd like to imagine him, as you'd like him to be, but not as he's revealed himself, well, that's mini faith. That's little faith, which is no faith at all. Now we come to the crunch. So if you've dozed off or if you're scrolling through your phone, uh, stop scrolling, uh, pinch yourself, come back, and we look at the key question raised by the next conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Another crucial conversation. The disciples have asked why they failed. Jesus says it's because of their mini-faith, their unbelief. What was wrong with it? Well, here we see it has to do with their continuing failure to understand what Jesus has come to do, what it means to be the Christ, the Son of God. You see, they didn't yet understand it, and faith is all to do with understanding. Many believe it's to do with feelings. It's not. It's due to understanding. Faith involves learning and te uh, thinking and understanding. And faith that is all feeling, well, that's and not understanding, well, that's just mini-faith, mini-golf. What matters for faith is understanding and the content of faith. So now you're saying, I believe. The question is, what do I believe? So now you're saying, I trust. The question is, in whom do I trust? What did the disciples need to trust in? What did they not yet understand? Or to put it slightly differently... As we did earlier, does the existence of suffering mean that God, who is both good and powerful, can have nothing to do with suffering? Does it mean that? No, because, and this is, this is the crux, verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Jesus' death, the cross, he must go there, he must go to Jerusalem and be crucified. That's why he came. The problem with their faith was their continuing failure to understand that the Christ must suffer and die. To trust in God is to trust in Christ, is to trust in his death. For them. They need to understand that. They must understand it and they must trust in it. So he tells them again and again but they don't understand, not yet. They're filled with grief. Do you remember the words the disciples heard at the transfiguration from God? One command, listen to him. The problem was they weren't listening. They heard the words, what had to happen, what must happen, but they weren't listening. They didn't understand what Jesus had come to do, 
and why he had to do it. They didn't understand the cross. They didn't yet believe it. They didn't yet trust in it. And that was why their faith was little faith, was unbelief. They didn't yet understand and trust Jesus' death for them because they weren't listening. What about you? Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself as a God who is intimately involved in the suffering of this world. Uh, that, that suffering doesn't deny your power or goodness. But it was in going to the cross uh, in our place that you won for us the salvation that you came to win. Thank you that you've revealed it. Thank you that you call us to understand it. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that all of us uh, watching, listening this morning may come to understand the wonder of what it means that the Christ came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. And we pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen.